This video explains how the brain simulator detects object motion using vision. This is just one of many components necessary to artificial general intelligence. This video has turned out to be a lot longer than I expected when I started it because the information turned out to be a lot more interesting than I expected. Consider this video clip. Your brain easily detects which people are in motion. Further, even when your viewpoint is changing, your brain still has no trouble, even though the entire visual field is different from moment to moment. Because you're watching a two-dimensional video clip right now, your brain doesn't get any useful cues from binocular vision or your inner ear detecting motion. These additional cues might be helpful in the real world, but eliminating them here lets us focus on the single vision mechanisms. Having a computer perform as well as your brain does on this task is still beyond the reach of computer perception, but it is a good target for development. And I'll use frames from this clip to illustrate how the algorithms work. In previous videos, I presented this perception pipeline and detecting motion is just a single step in that process. I briefly showed this in action and in this video, I'll provide a lot more detail. The objectives are to detect two possible object motions. First, a change in object position relative to your position and an apparent size change, which represents a change in distance and of course some combination. The objects themselves may also be changing in any number of ways like walking or turning around or waving an arm, but that's a separate topic for another video. In this video, we'll also talk about object motion versus a change in the point of view. And there are several changes in point of view which are possible. In a nutshell, to detect motion, you compare the visual field right now to the visual field from a moment ago and look for changes, comparing the current frame with the previous frame to use the language of video. This could potentially be done on the image itself, and the insect brain undoubtedly works at this level. It's a simple matter to detect changes in adjacent pixels to detect motion. But inferring the direction of motion is a bit more complex, and handling changes of object size is even more complex at this level. And when you consider detecting changes in viewpoint, it's easier later down the pipeline to consider objects instead of pixels. Fortunately, other necessary steps in the perception pipeline contribute to this process. The boundary segment and area steps already create a position and size parameter for every detected object in the visual field. As there are many fewer areas than there are pixels, we can be a lot more exhaustive in computation if we're using objects instead of pixels. So putting the process later in the pipeline makes things easier. So the content of the previous frame is stored in the mental model in terms of references to object sizes and locations. All this information is stored in the universal knowledge store, which is discussed in other videos. These algorithms can also be used to estimate the distances to objects, as I'll explain shortly. Here are the basic steps in the algorithm, and I'll expand on these in a moment. For objects, each visible area is matched up against its corresponding objects in the mental model. The system does this by comparing object centers and various characteristics but could use all points of interest. If no near match is found, the object is presumed to have appeared and is added to the list for related processing. After all the matches are complete, objects in the mental model, which should have been in the visual field but are not, are presumed to have disappeared. For all objects with matches, the system then calculates a delta vector between the old and new positions, and the magnitude of this motion vector represents the amount of motion, and the angle represents the direction of the motion. 
Now it's a simple matter to evaluate all the delta vectors for motion and the sizes of the objects for a change in size, and then we can finally update the mental model. If only a few objects are moving and all the others are static, it's easy to notice a few objects in motion. In this clip, the point of view is not changing. So we'll look at two nearby frames and see how the algorithm works. The system calculates the motion vectors for all the objects it detects. In this case, the motion vectors are null for the overwhelming majority of points of interest in the visual field, and I've highlighted only a few. Just the moving people have motion vectors which are significantly different, and so they're easy to detect. In addition to moving, objects can change size. The point of view here is stable and the image of the ball increases in size. Your brain immediately assumes that the ball is moving toward you because that's a much more likely interpretation, but when you look at the individual frames it's easy to see that the image of the ball changes in size and it's your brain which is deciding it is probably moving toward you. In fact, because it's a flat video it's not moving at all. To give you an idea how fast this process works in your brain, though, these four adjacent frames are only a thirtieth of a second apart. So that's motion detection for a non-moving point of view. But wait, of course, there's more. Object motion is actually a relatively rare event when you compare it against all the objects you see which aren't moving and the objects which change size are extremely rare, which is why your brain assumes that an increasing size represents a motion towards you. But what is much more common is a change in point of view. Just moving your eyes completely changes the images received at your retina. If most of the objects in your field of view are moving, then it's more likely that the objects are static and it's your eyes which have moved. Like the baseball coming toward you, your brain assumes a change in point of view. As I mentioned, there are six possible changes in point of view and I'll describe how each is handled. Let's start with an angular change. This clip represents what I call an angular change in point of view, pan or tilt in the language of video cameras. The location of the point of view doesn't move, but its direction changes, either horizontally or vertically. This change in point of view is, the, is most common as it happens whenever you move your eyes or turn your head. When we look at some nearby frames in the video and draw a few motion vectors, you'll see that all of the static objects have an apparent motion vector which are about the same. So if most of the motion vectors are about the same, your point of view has changed in an angular manner. We can detect this motion with a clustering algorithm which will show a large cluster of very similar motions which can be averaged. Then this motion can be deducted from all of the objects in the field and any objects or people which still have a relative motion vector are actually moving and should get attention. The remaining changes in point of view are a bit more complex to detect. Let's start with lateral motion, up and down or side to side as in this clip. When you look at nearby frames, the motion vectors of non-moving objects have the same direction, but different magnitudes depending on their di distance away. The further away, the smaller the apparent motion. The fact that apparent motion is proportional to distance is an important cue to understanding depth, which I'll cover in a separate video. If you know the true distance of your own motion, you can estimate the distances to all the objects in your field of view with considerable precision. In this case, we can cluster the motion vectors based on direction and ignore the magnitude. Once again, subtracting the point of view motion leaves us able to detect moving objects because they have a remaining motion vector. 
but the true motion of moving objects can be ambiguous without assuming a distance to the object from other cues. In this case, we assume that the car is moving at a given rate because of the way its motion vector differs from that of the nearby lamp post. In absolute terms, a small motion vector could mean a nearby object moving a little or a far away object moving a lot more. Motion in the third dimension, that is moving your point of view forward or back or zooming the camera, is a bit more complicated. Once again, we look at nearby frames and calculate the motion vectors for many points in the visual field. We'll see that they vary a lot in both direction and magnitude. To determine the motion of our point of view, consider all the motion vectors and extend them. If most of these extended vectors intersect in a point, then the point of view is moving directly toward or away from that point depending on whether the vectors are pointing toward or away from the point. Once again, the magnitude of the motion is an important cue to the distance to the object. Once the change in point of view has been determined, the predicted motion vector can be determined for every object in the visual field based on its estimated distance, and that can be subtracted from the motion vector to find the object's true motion. Objects with remaining non-zero vectors are actually in motion. Rotating the point of view is a lot less common in videos, but happens whenever you tilt your head to one side. The brain is quite adept at doing this transformation. You have no difficulty reading this rotated text without tilting your head. As illustrated in this clip, you have no trouble assuming that the ocean, sky, and clouds are stable, while it's our point of view on the boat which is rotating. As we look at two nearby frames, as in the previous case, apparent motion vectors will vary depending on their distance from the center of rotation. To find that center of rotation, instead of extending the motion vectors themselves as we did for zoom, we extend perpendiculars or normal vectors to these motion vectors, and to the extent these meet at a single point, we have a point of view rotation around that point. After all that processing, we have several lists of objects. Objects which have appeared are added to the mental model in the UKS, and those which have disappeared are removed. Objects which have moved have their positions updated in the mental model, and objects in the mental model can be tagged so that they can be remembered even when you can't see them. If this is a lateral or zoom change in point of view, objects in the mental model can also have an estimated depth updated. Finally, the change in point of view can be used to update the positions of objects which are in the mental model but not currently visible, like objects you know are behind you. If you know an object is behind you and you walk forward, you'll know that it's now further away behind you. Knowing the change in point of view can be used in subsequent processing because the change at one moment is likely to be similar to a change in the next. Likewise, the observed motion of objects can be used to predict motion on subsequent steps and speed recognition. Here's a quick look at the prototype software in action. Keep in mind that it only functions on simple geometric shapes, not because of the motion detection process here, but because of limitations in earlier stages in the pipeline. Here we can see the detection of objects appearing and disappearing. Here we can see a single object moving, while others are stable. Here we see a, a detection of a change in point of view, changing in the left-right axis, the x-axis in this orientation. Here we can see the detection of the point of view moving toward or away from that image, 
the z-axis in this orientation. And finally, in this demonstration, we see that the system can detect both a change in point of view and object motion simultaneously. Having explored the complexity of understanding object motion with a moving point of view, one can't help but be impressed with their brain's remarkable ability to handle this task. All of this ability represents just a single step in the perception pipeline, which is a part of general intelligence. I hope you've enjoyed this video. You can also try out all these processes on your own by downloading the Brain Simulator and trying out the Perception Network with the Motion folder of test data. Get the source code for the Brain Simulator and contribute to the project. And for more on how this all fits in with the overall strategy leading to artificial general intelligence, read a few of my books like Will Computers Revolt and The Brain Simulator 2. Links are in the description below. Please take this opportunity to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching.